of light. And thank you for that singing. You may be seated. All right, well, let's take our Bibles tonight and let's go to the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 4, if we could. 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 4. While on a South Pole expedition, British explorer Sir Ernest Shackleton left a few men on Elephant Island, promising that he would return to rescue them. Later, when he tried to go back, huge icebergs blocked the way for Shackleton. But suddenly, as if by a miracle, as an avenue opened in the an avenue opened in the ice, and Shackleton was able to get through. His men, ready and waiting, quickly scrambled aboard. No sooner had the ship cleared the island than the ice crashed together behind them. Contemplating their narrow escape, the explorer said to his men, It was fortunate you were all packed and ready to go. Well, they replied, We never gave up hope. Whenever the sea was clear of ice, we rolled up our sleeping bags and reminded each other, The boss may come today. Tonight, as we continue our series on eternal things, I'd like to consider uh, a generation of people who will be fortunate enough never to experience going through the door of death. That group will be brought actually directly to heaven via an event we often refer to as the rapture. The rapture. We may very well be part of that generation. Wouldn't that be an exciting thing? Wouldn't that be a, an extraordinary, unique thing to be part of the generation that doesn't go through death's portal, but is taken up to meet the Lord in the air and be with Him forever? We may very well be part of that generation, especially as we consider or we witness the stage, the world stage being set for the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we'll pick it up in verse 13. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now I'll go to chapter 5. For the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord is come, so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travel, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day shall, shall overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. Ye, we are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and of love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight, let's consider this event, this eternal event, that is kind of the exception for us getting into eternity. Uh, the rapture itself, is I'm going to be talking about what I call the great escape. The great escape. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time to be in thy word. I pray that it would be a good reminder for some, maybe a first time lesson for others. Whatever the need is tonight, I pray that you would speak to hearts clearly. Help me communicate, help my mind to, to put, formulate the thoughts and the words to come out appropriately. Most importantly, Lord, we ask that the Spirit of God would speak vividly through these truths we'll see in Jesus name. Amen. Now last time when I spoke on eternal things of course I talked about the door to eternity. In other words the portal in which everyone will pass through with the exception of this group involved with the rapture and we'll talk about that more in a moment. But most people are going to go through, of course, death's door. The Bible does say in Hebrews 9.27, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. 
Again, death is an eminent thing for everybody. Should the Lord tarry in regards to his coming, we will, all, we will experience the passage through that door. We will step through that door at some point. We will go through that portal. Being saved, though, helps to lessen the fear of that day most everyone fears, right? It's, it's according to Hebrews chapter 2, it's a fear that debilitates every person of not knowing what happens after they pass on. And uh, what's on the other side of death's door? A lot of people have a lot of wild hopes, but they don't have a whole lot of security or, or certainty or assurance about what's going to happen the minute their heart stops. And that is a very scary thing. I had it for 20-some years of my life, and it drove me to begin to seek answers from God. And if you're in that situation right now, I want to encourage you highly, you need to seek your answers from God and don't, get, don't settle until it gets settled. Because we're talking about something that's much longer than this life ever will, will be. The Bible likens this life as a vapor that appeareth for a short time, yet vanisheth away. But um, eternity is forever. And once you cross that threshold into eternity, going through death's door, that's it. That's it. There's no changing your final destination. Of course, being saved makes a big difference. It helps lessen that fear because we know what's on the horizon because we've prepared for eternity. What's sad, though, is so few will, will take time to consider where their eternally bound soul is heading. Again, many erroneously assume that everything's just going to work out somehow and, everybody, and everyone's just going to end up in heaven anyways unless you're really, really bad like Hitler and Mussolini and all the other tyrants of the past and even of the present. But the Bible says that it only takes one sin to keep a person out of heaven. James 2.10 says you can keep the whole law and, and offend in one point and be guilty of all. You know, one sin is all it takes to condemn us. And we need to have our sins uh, atoned for by the blood of Jesus Christ. That happens the day we, we trust Him as Savior when we are willing to repent of our sin and trust Him to save our soul by blotting out our sins with His blood. It's sad, though, that though we, everyone knows that they have a date with this destiny of death, how few people take it seriously enough to consider you know, what's going to happen to them. Again, just holding on to some kind of flimsy hope that, yeah, I think everything's going to work out. Yeah, you know what? I don't want a flimsy hope before I step into that side of, of reality that I do not see yet. I want to know what's going on. And I want to have some assurance. And I don't want to have guesswork. And I don't, because you know what? If I get it wrong, I have a long, 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 long time to regret it. And I can't change it. I can't change what happens to me or anybody else the minute they step through that door. So this is something that is extremely serious. This is not something that needs procrastination. This is something that needs to be addressed with a, with a sense of urgency. And tonight, if you are not saved and you are not prepared for this, it's time to get, get it in gear and start seeking the Lord with all your heart because you'd have no idea when you're going to pass through death's door. You have no clue. God in His mercy and His love and His grace is giving you an opportunity, but you must respond to that light. If you do not respond to that light, or you just take it lightly, procrastinate, do a more convenient time, that light may not come back. That's how serious this stuff is. We take the Bible seriously here, because the Bible is true. It reveals to us what's to come. It helps lift the fog over what happens on the other side. It's very really sad that people all have a date with this, death, uh, with this destiny of death, but yet they'll just lollygag when it comes to addressing it and preparing for it. Again, some think they can procrastinate on their eternal preparation, but that procrastination could be eternally lethal. Because again, none of us know the day we're going to die. If you go to Luke chapter number 12, there was an example given by Christ about a man who uh, had, a, had grand plans for his life and everything was just going well and he was going to retire in style and he had all the money and the wealth to do so. But God here shows us the truth of the fragility of our life. Look at verse 16. 
And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will build... I will pull down my barns and will build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto them, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. In other words, tonight you're actually going to die. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. There's a lot of different truths that are brought up in that story, but the whole point is the man was thinking he was going to live for quite some time, and I have all the time in the world to deal with things. I'm going to, I'm going to live it up, eat, you know, eat, drink, and live with ease. But that night, God said, your soul's going to be required of you. And you know what? All that stuff that he was distracted with no longer meant anything, did it? So God in his mercy, of course, reaches out to people in love for their souls to encourage them. You need to get prepared for that moment. Don't allow the bells and the whistles of this world to grab so much of your attention that you fail to prepare for the moment you pass from this life into the next. Because we always stand one breath, one heartbeat, one step away from eternity at any given moment of our day. Our lives are really that fragile. They really are. We may not feel like it at times. We may feel like, oh, I've got plenty of years to go, but the Bible says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. We, we don't know. But just as looming as death, there is another event that is just as eminent. It's the return of Jesus Christ. That's just as eminent as death. (laughs) And the thing that kicks it off is this event that we often refer to as the rapture. Of course, the word rapture is not found here, but it's taken from a Latin word, raptuum, that means being caught up as it mentions in verse 17, caught up together, snatched away. In the Greek, it is in reference to the kind of the, the, the violent snatching away, I mean, because it happened so quickly. The Apostle Paul was writing to the church at Thessalonica in this epistle as they were greatly concerned that they had actually missed this event, that they had been left behind because of the persecution that they had been experiencing as uh, new believers. And Paul wrote 1 and 2 Thessalonians, again, to remind them of some truths they evidently had forgotten about what the future had in store beyond the rapture. We'll talk about a little bit of that tonight. But before that, before... um, the events that, that we often refer to as the tribulation period take place, the rapture was the very first thing that would snatch them away from having to live through that time period. And that's what Paul was reminding them of. Hence, the title, The Great Escape, comes from the idea that God's going to execute a great escape, great rescue mission, if you will, before he plunges this world into a time period unlike any other period that has ever existed on the planet. If you look at verse number 9 of 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath. It's not God's desire for that. So he has this plan to execute this great escape for his people before this world plunges into that time period. And with that escape, that generation won't taste death per se, (laughs) but will be brought to heaven with the blast of the trumpet sound. Let's consider more in regards to this, I guess I might call, alternate portal into eternity that will be available at the time of the rapture. As we talk about, first off, what I call the sudden departure. 
Now, as I mentioned, this event is eminent. The word eminent means it could happen at any moment. It could happen in, the, in a split second. It could happen very, very quickly. When the Lord taught on this subject, he taught his disciples as a result to always watch and be ready because of this eminent fact about his return and this event we call the rapture. Go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 is a very prophetic chapter of the scriptures as Jesus is giving them some insight on what is to come down the road. They had asked him about it, and he, uh, he responded. Let's pick it up in verse 35 of this passage. It says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. First point to note here is that what God has said is going to happen. It may not have happened yet, but it's only a matter of time. And in fact, it's so sure that heaven and earth could pass away well before that God's word would ever be compl- uh, not happen. But he goes on and says, But that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days they were, that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, till the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You notice here that Jesus uses the, 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 the Noah, I guess the Noah, we'll call it the Noah's Ark story, to, to help us understand the suddenness that comes upon the world with this event. That, you know, people are just going to be out there living their lives as they always had in verse 38 until the day that Noah entered the ark. And then it said, and knew not until the flood came. And then all of a sudden it started raining and by that point it was too late. But the suddenness, the eminency of it, is what's being pictured here. Verse 40, it says, Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Verse 42, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come, but know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Again, there's a lot of emphasis about the eminency of this event, of this return of Christ. Now, the return of Christ, just as a little side note here to help you understand, comes really in two phases. The first phase is what we're talking about, the rapture. The second phase is, is, the, is the bodily return, when he comes back and actually touches down on the earth and, and commences another uh, period of time we call the millennial kingdom. We won't get into that tonight, but I, I just want to clarify on that because sometimes we talk about the return of the Lord in, in these terms generically and kind of lump them together, but they are two distinct uh, uh, parts that go along with it. We're talking about the first part, though, uh, when Jesus, or, or when the trumpet sounds and the rapture takes place. But it appears that, that this will all transpire when people are least expecting it. The execution of this event is likened to that, of course, as a thief in the night, unexpected and sudden. If you go back to our text in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter number 5, that portion of it, if I can get back there, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, verse 2, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as the thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, notice they, they think everything's all right. <laughs> They're deceived into thinking that everything's going to be okay. Uh, by, the, by what is transpiring in the world. Everything's looking good. Everything's looking up. And then all of a sudden, sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. Again, this event is likened to that of a, as a thief that comes in the night, unexpected and sudden, without warning. But, by, but it happens, and the events that transpire take place in such a way that you cannot escape them. Second Peter 3.10 mentions that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In other words, nobody knows when it's going to happen. It's not a matter of if, but it's just a matter of when. In fact, as we read our text, it appears that Paul even anticipated the return of Christ, this event, the rapture, during his own lifetime. Look at verse 17 of chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians then we, 
which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Notice he's writing as if he's fully expecting it. That we, if we're, we're around, if we're not dead, you know, which could happen in our life, we will be up there. So, I mean, it's been something that's been on the minds of God's people for since the very openings of the New Testament era. When John received the book of the Revelation, three times in Revelation 22, the last chapter, it says, Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. And then in verse 20, he says it this way, Surely I come quickly. <laughs> He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. And then John adds, Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. But notice again the eminency, the fervency, the, the expectation, the mentality that exists uh, from the writers. That they live with this idea that this, there will be a sudden departure. And that they could be part of that. Well, people will say, well, it's been a long time since these writers first penned this down. 1,900 plus years now. Are we so sure that this is going to happen? We'll go to 2 Peter chapter number 3. 2 Peter chapter number 3. Peter writes in verse 3, we'll pick it up. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying... Where is the promise of his coming, right? Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. You know, notice here that there, there is going to be scoffers who are going to say, well, it hasn't happened yet. Christians have been saying this for hundreds of years, almost two millenniums. You know, why? How, how do you know this is for sure? Thing, the sun goes down, the sun comes up, just like it did the day before. But it mentions in verse 5 the response to that. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that, went, that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. In other words, another reference back to Noah's flood. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. So in some regards, this time period may seem long to human beings, but to God it's only been a couple of days in feeling. This isn't as long as... When you, when you put it in the scope of eternity, yeah, it... it it's not much time. Verse 9 explains it in completion. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. In other words, God's going to come through with what he says about the return and so forth. But is long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The reason the Lord is the latest coming is because he's allowing time for the human race to respond to his message of salvation. He's giving time for that. You know, it's, spe it's been speculated that God is trying to f wait until there's been enough people saved that would replace the angelic population that had been deceased. I don't know, uh, that went in rebellion with Satan. I don't know if that's true, but it is a thought. Is that possible? I don't know. But I know that there is a certain number that I think God is trying to hit. And when that hits then those events start taking place. But in the meantime, God has extended this age of grace for this time so that you and I can respond to the message, that we can get saved and be right with Him and be on the right side of things when all this stuff comes, uh, comes into play. He's extending this age of grace to see souls brought to salvation. And I think if you're saved here tonight, you're very thankful that he does. And if you've got people that you care about that you really want to see saved, I'm sure you're glad as well that they're getting, 
as much opportunity as possible. But the truth is, too, that God can end this at any moment by commencing this event, by sending forth the archangel and saying, okay, it's time to blow that trumpet. And he can do that at any moment. He's not, he didn't tell us when that moment was going to be. Now, there have been many people who have tried to predict that in the past to their own shame, even in most recent years. But no man knoweth the day or the hour. But the point is this. It could happen tonight before we end this service. It could be a hundred years from now, as far as we know. But Jesus, in his words of admonition, and many of the New Testament writers always push this idea, hey, you better be prepared. You better be prepared, because it's going to happen at some point when you least expect it. For the unsaved, once this rapture hits, and they've had an opportunity to be saved, they've had the opportunity to to hear the message of redemption, they pushed it off or rejected it. it. Did you know that those people will not have an opportunity to get saved once the rapture takes place? How do you know? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You want to flip there quick. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And in verse number 10, the Bible says, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. In other words, these people had the opportunity to get saved. They had the truth at their fingertips. They could have pursued it. They could have done all that, but they chose not to. And within context here, it's explaining how uh, it's talking about prophetic things. We'll see a few more verses in this passage in a moment. But the point is that they didn't love the truth. They loved their, uh, their sin more. And as a result, if that rapture hits, they will no longer have an opportunity to be saved. Why? Because God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Hence, if you're not prepared by being saved, then I would admonish you, you've either got death knocking at your door or the rapture. So... <laughs> Maybe it's time to start getting serious about that. Number two, we see the stark disclosure. Now many things transpire as a result of the rapture itself. There's there's lots of things that start happening that are going to be quite stark (laughs) compared to what we're used to experiencing in this world. The first thing that takes place at the rapture is that the Holy Spirit of God is taken off the earth. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7, I believe is in reference to the Holy Ghost, the He here. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. He that now letteth or preventeth or stifened or, or however you want to phrase it will let. Who's the He? I believe it's the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit at now is, is presently at work in this world. As God's people pray, and the Holy Spirit goes to work in various parts of the globe. Even where there appears to be no work of the Spirit of God, there is. See, the, the Spirit is, is going about, and He's actually suppressing the evil of this world. If you can believe it or not, this world is being, the, the evil of it is actually being suppressed. Because the Holy Spirit of God is testifying of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. That was going to be his job, according to Jesus in John 16, 8-11. And when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. So the Spirit of God is at work in, in various ways around the world, actually suppressing evil. But at the rapture, he's immediately taken off the earth. And it's evident that those who are saved, who have the Holy Spirit abiding within within them, will be just taken with him as well. As a result, evil will flourish like never before. It It will go unchecked. Which will lead to, number two, a world in a brand new phase. In a time period that it's never seen before. It's often referred to as the tribulation period. The time of Jacob's trouble. 
Daniel's 70th week. These are all uh, things that, that uh, describe this period of time. And upon this rapture event, the world will enter into this period that lasts roughly seven years, which will be a period of mass destruction, judgment, and death. This, time, this period of time is mentioned in a variety of places throughout the scriptures, but Revelation chapter 4 through 19 expounds a vast amount of detail regarding the subject. It goes into great detail, and there's many parts of it we, don't even, we can't even begin to explain. People try to explain it, but, they're, but it's just at, at best an educated guess. But there are going to be some really strange things that take place. The supernatural will be far more vivid than, than ever before. And it's going to be quite obvious that there is a work, a, a God going on unlike any other. In fact, God keeps it to only seven years in length. For if he did not, the whole human population on the planet would be eradicated. That's how bad it's going to be. Mark 13, 20. And except that the Lord has shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. In other words, nobody would be alive. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. Now the rapture appears to be the event that commences this time period. It, 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 it kind of opens it up and you can about imagine why when you have people across the planet that are going to be disappearing, you talk about an upheaval. We've seen some upheaval in the world, uh, haven't we, over the last year plus and what a little virus can do. How would you like, what do you think it's going to be like when a bunch of people disappear off the planet for no explainable reason, at least to them? People are going to be like, what, what happened here? A lot of strange stuff will begin to, to fly. Number three, there's a man that will be revealed that it plays a significant role during that seven-year period. He's, he's referred to by many names in the Scripture. The one that, I, that, is, that has been used, is and I'll use tonight, is the is the phrase or the term Antichrist. It mentions it in 2 Thessalonians 2. We'll pick it up in verse 3. It says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. <coughs> Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God setteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now you know that with what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked, again, these are all references to this Antichrist, be revealed, who the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and will destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. The rapture appears to trigger a significant enough global crisis that will enable the alignment of a global society. More than ever, there is talk of a global society. The, I, think, I think that's pretty evident. I've, I remember talking to students at the University of Minnesota, you know, since we've, we've had the ministry there over the last, I guess, decade now. And they, they talk, all it is is globalism. Globalism, globalism, globalism. That's all they're talking about. And uh, certain different crises have, have popped up over the years that have pushed us more in that direction than ever before. But this crisis that will come about as the rapture and other things that may transpire shortly after it is going to allow for the alignment of this global society to take place where the world will come under one leader and that leader will be the Antichrist. He will be revealed after the rapture he will come on the scene having answers to the world's problems. And he will ascend to global prominence to the point the world literally turns itself over to his leadership. And for about three and a half years, he will reign unchecked 
in this world. Revelation 13, 5 mentions the Antichrist. It says, And there was given unto him the Antichrist, the mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months, which is two and a half years. He will literally be Satan incarnate. As Satan will possess him. Because Satan will have been kicked out of heaven. And there's a lot of details that revolve around that. I don't have time to get into. But he will rule the world with an iron fist. Guaranteeing certain death to all who will not undoubtedly give their allegiance to him. The Lord Jesus Christ, though, upon his physical return, the second part of this, of this uh, return to Christ, upon his physical return to earth at the end of the tribulation period, will ca literally cast him alive into the lake of fire. Revelation 19.20 And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet, and that wrought miracles before him, and with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. These things are all disclosed upon the completion of the brief yet jarring world event that we call the rapture. Again, I'm thankful that I'm not going to be here when all this transpires. Because if you think the world is ruthless now, just wait. The worst is yet to be until God finally puts a stop to it all. And Satan is once and for all overthrown. Well, thirdly and finally, we see the saint's disposition. Knowing that as eminent as death is, the rapture could happen at any moment, what does this say about our lives? How should we, how should we approach life knowing what the Bible has to say about this event, this eternal event, if you will? What should be our disposition to these truths? Well, number one, again, if you are not saved, it's time to get serious about your eternity. Because the last thing you want to do is be left behind. Because once it occurs, there's no going back for you. Number two, if you are saved, then we are responsible to live in the light of this truth by preparing for what's to come by being prepared for the moment that trumpet blast sounds. If you go back to Matthew 24, again, we have read some passages within that chapter, but there's a few more I want to I wanna read in regards to what I'm, what I'm talking about here. It says in verse 42 again, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready for such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Who then is, the, is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant when his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if the evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is aware, not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Notice in this passage, the wise and faithful servant, or saint, if you will, they live every day, knowing that this could be the day, that this could be the very day my Lord comes back, when the boss shows back up, like, like those like Shackleton's men I mentioned a moment ago. These are people who live ready for that return. You know, the eminency of this event was meant to encourage faithfulness, perseverance, and purity in regards to Christian life. Why? Because it's, in, it's meant to encourage us to be on our best behavior, if you will. 
because we don't know when he's going to show up. And if you see it, if you see the truth from God's word in that light, it's not hard to to be motivated to live in those regards. To persevere even when it's difficult to live purely knowing that, you know, my life, you know, I don't want to be caught in a position or a situation that would cause me to be, as some have put it, red faced at the rapture. I want to live, I want to be faithful because the Lord has a reward for me if I'm faithful to Him. You know, we don't want to be caught off guard by the Lord's return like the evil servant was. Living as if His Lord delays His coming only to be caught with His hand in the cookie jar, so to say, spiritually. Our desire should be to see the upper taker instead of the undertaker. Amen. Go to Titus chapter number 2. Titus chapter number 2. Paul puts it well here. In Titus 2 verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, this is often referred to as the blessed hope, that the Lord is coming back and He's going to rescue us before He executes His wrath. And living with that in mind, verse 12 becomes a reality in our lives. At the height of World War II, Protestant theologian Diedrich Bonhoeffer was in prison for taking a stand against Hitler, yet he continued to urge his fellow believers to resist Nazi tyranny. A group of Christians believing that Hitler was the Antichrist asked Bonhoeffer, why do you expose yourself to all this danger? Jesus will return any day and all your work and suffering will be for nothing. Bonhoeffer replied, if Jesus returns tomorrow, then tomorrow I'll rest from my labor. But today I have work to do. I must continue the struggle until it's finished. And that's the same idea for us. Yeah, the Lord may be coming back. That's not a time to to let up on the gas, so to say. It's actually the time to get it in gear. Because the night cometh when no man can work. And the day that that rapture hits, it'll be done. We must continue to be faithful knowing that our great escape could very well be right around the corner. May God help us to be prepared for it. Amen. Let's stand to our feet tonight with every head bowed and every eye closed. The pianist is going to take a few moments to to play. But if God has spoken to your heart in some regards, I want to give you an opportunity to to spend some time with God. You know, maybe today we, we think so much about the here and now, but whether it's death or the return of Christ, we have to remember that these things are going to happen And nothing can stop them. The only one that controls the timing of all of that is God. And God has, in his long suffering, allowed for a space of grace for for people to be saved and for us to be used by him to reach others for Christ. But eventually, one of these days, one of these hours are going to come boom, that's it. It's done. It's done. Tonight, if you're not saved, if you're not prepared, can I encourage you to take the steps you need to start seeking the Lord, start asking questions. We'd be glad to help you with Bible studies and things like that to answer those spiritual questions because 
you deserve a Bible answer on how to be prepared. Don't go into eternity or, or think that you're going to be the exception to God's word, what he says about getting to heaven the right way. There's no exception clauses. There's no alter, alternative paths. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You must come to him. But we have something to look forward to, Christian. It may want to be great to be part of this generation that uh, gets to experience this. What an opportunity. With the way the world is going, more and more you see the alignment of nations, alignment of ideologies towards this one goal. May we see things in the light of God's word and respond appropriately. Father in heaven, we thank you for this evening, this opportunity to be in the house of God. We thank you for the truth that we looked at tonight. I pray that it would have been a help and, uh, under, in our, and enrich our understanding of the events to come in eternity and what brings us into that world, if you will, of the eternal Father, thank you for this night. We do pray that you'd bless the preaching of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, quick announcements. Of course, Saturday we do have outreach at 1030. If you can come out and help us distribute uh, those invitation cards for the upcoming conference, we'd be greatly appreciated. Uh, we uh, have um, probably a couple thousand to get rid of between now and the conference and uh, just praying that uh, God will enable us to do that. I don't think it will be too hard uh, if we just get a little help. But if you can join us for that, that would be great this Sunday. Of course, looking forward to being in God's house again this Sunday as well as uh, we, we worship here. And I encourage you to try to invite somebody if you can uh, and uh, try to bring them here this next Sunday. Well, with that said, I think I'm just going to close with a word of prayer and uh, then you'll be dismissed. Okay? Father in heaven, tonight we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your graciousness. We pray that you would bless now our time in thy word. May we go forth with this renewed knowledge. Uh, and Lord, I pray that we would live with it, uh, live our lives in light of this eternal, these eternal truths so that you may be glorified through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you are dismissed. Have a good night.